Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar with Barry Bassnett from Rich Pixel. Barry is going to be talking about uh, shadow busting, how to get better images and data, something that is crucial to anyone who uses data from drones in particular. Barry has been a photogrammatist, I can't say the word, photogrammetrist, cartographer and surveyor, there we go, I got it, for 43 years working on projects in over 80 countries and a few planets. He is passionate about improving imagery for digital heritage workflows in photogrammetry, inspection imagery, submillimeter, large scale metrology and do object documentation. He has a wealth of knowledge and we are delighted that he is here to share it with us this afternoon. So I'm going to pause my video, etc. Do actually do you want to just check that you can share your screen okay, Barry? And then I will disappear from view. Can you see my screen? Should be we blank can right indeed. Now. Hold on. Yes. Right. Uh, let me get up what I need to do. Can you see my logo and my name? I can indeed, yes. Perfect. That's going to help me a lot. So, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to this lunchtime. Um, I'll pass some webinar things. I'm going to be, um, over the next half hour, sharing some tips and tricks about one of the big problems we have in drones uh, and imagery in general. A um, uh, bit of introduction. You've got something from Eleanor. My, uh, she's covered most of what I do. Um, my big thing at the moment, really, though, is is really teaching people how to get better imagery. I still go out and do work myself, so I'm always working on those things. But um, let me see if I can get this down. Oh, we'll skip that bit. That's a plug at the end. Don't worry about that. So um, this is uh, I come from a generation of surveyors who um, hold on a sec. I've just moved something out of the way. Give me a bit of more real estate. I come from a generation of people not like this. Obviously, I dressed far better than this guy. But um, in the days before drones, we used to have to get into weird, really weird positions to take photographs. But I just draw your attention to the camera. Um, in the old days, when I started, we used to have to take big cameras out. We used to have to take all our developing chemicals and film and uh, film backs and stuff and then find a room somewhere where we could actually develop the chemical to develop the images loop you can look loops and, and before we left now obviously digital photography has changed things an awful lot um and my interest really is i work with a lot of drone operations a lot of inspection operations where we're trying to make sure we get the best image quality we can now i know everybody probably on this is a great drone pilot or works but what we're talking about the thing basically drones there to be a platform for the camera and it's the image which is really important on here um, and we're going to be talking about specifically about shadows and specifically about dynamic range and um, why is this important well it's pretty crucial to pretty well all the sort of things we do but just to give you an idea um, the human eye is very good at capturing light. We can capture about 24 EVs with our pupils, and an EV is the equivalent of an f-stop, and one f-stop is a doubling of the amount of light. So the human eye is brilliant at being able to adjust. Um, a high-end camera that will get a digital single-lens reflex or mirrorless camera that is capturing raw or DNG files, same thing really, just different name. Um, that can capture around about 15 f-stops. Um, JPEGs will capture about eight and printed images because actually JPEGs are there to print out an image. They capture about eight f-stops as well. Now, what that, what that basically means is that on a bright summer's day, we are going to get areas which are overexposed or we call clipped or sometimes underexposed. Days like today, I'm up in the West Coast of Scotland, um, what we've got is uh, just a dull overcast day, perfect for photogrammetry. But as we get into the spring and summer, wouldn't it be great if we could actually capture all the sorts of things, all the light conditions that we've got to deal with? Um, we're talking about here image quality. And image quality impacts all the stages 
workflows. So whether we're just using our drone to fly and get inspection imagery. So that could be uh, everything, you know, from telecom towers to roofs to all sorts of things. What will happen on a, on a summer's day with the sun's out is although the camera in the drone will take a, a reading, it won't be able to capture the whole dynamic range of that scene. So what we will get is areas of shadow and areas of highlight. Now, shadows, it turns out, are quite easy for us to fix. But the problem that we have if we get highlights and overexposure is if you get highlighted areas pretty well, you've lost any data that you get in that. So there's no pixel information. And my business is called Rich Pix because what we try and do is recall or recover every pixel. Right now, that presents a number of problems for us. Um, just an inspection, because if I'm expecting a telecoms tower and there's a white box, I don't know. I've, I lose data. And if we lose data, the equivalent would be if I was to print that image out, no ink would come out of that jet for that pixel. But it gets even more complicated when we move into things like photogrammetry, because if we have areas that are clipped or areas that are in shadow, overexposed, then we have no data in those. And this is really important, as we'll go through in a second. And also one of my loves is 360 degree photography. And when we're stitching images together, if we get overexposed or different or different lighting from the sun being in the image, we get all sorts of things which are going to pack the image quality. Now, we, you, I don't have, I've got a very little small drone that is sat crashed on my desk. I don't own a drone. But some of you will have been invested a lot of money in your drone or drone fleets. Um, wouldn't it be sensible to figure out how you can maximize that and get the best image quality out? Well, that's what we're going to be showing you over the next few minutes. Right. So how what do we need to do with this? Well, we need to learn how to use some image editing tools. And there are three sorts of tools that we can use or three set stages to this. The first one is image editing. How can we recover and, and get highlights and shadows and eliminate or reduce the impact of those? But the problem that we have is a lot of these image editing tools are designed really for one-off images. Um, how do we actually patch? How do we map? How do we do with bulk images? We could have a hundred, a thousand images. How do I adjust all those? Okay, we're going to show you shortly a quick way of doing it. But now as well, over the last probably six months, the whole slew of AI tools have come in, which helps us with this process. And before we go into AI and the pros and cons of it, the AI tools I'm talking about are not adding pixels, they're just enhancing pixels, okay? So we're not actually gonna add anything because that wouldn't be right because we don't wanna add data that doesn't exist, do we? So, but there are AI tools which have come out just recently uh, that can save you a lot of time, especially when it comes to automated inspection. But some of the automated inspection systems you'll see on LinkedIn and things, they require images to be consistent and to be a good quality. Otherwise, AI doesn't really work as well as it should do. So what is the impact of um, hidden of this data that we've lost? Well, if we talk about just photogrammetry, um, obviously with inspection imagery, if I, if I can't see something's overexposed, I can't see or inspect it properly. But when we come into photogrammetry, it causes us a whole slew of problems. Um, which you may not realize is impacting on your mesh, or sorry, on your, on your point cloud and then your mesh. So it will impact if we've got areas in highlights or showers, it's going to reduce the number of tie points that we use. Now, I'm assuming some of you know how photogrammetry works. Basically, we, it looks at getting similar points of groups of pixels, like a little digital fingerprint. It uses a thing, most use a thing called the SIFT algorithm. I've got time to go into that, but if you want more information, just send me an email and we can have a chat about it. So the number of tie points we need in overlapping images, if I've got areas that are overexposed or underexposed, um, then I'm not going to get the issue. I'm not going to get the number of tying points, so that will reduce the accuracy. Same thing happens if I've got shadows or highlights in areas of overlap, which are crucial. I need to be able to see in two or three images. One thing that does impact is if you're using white GCPs or, 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 or checkpoint targets, sometimes if it's, white, if it's sunny, they'll get overexposed and the automated system for picking them up doesn't work. And then you get weird stuff. But also then you get hidden detail in your author photos, in your models, in your meshes. And the critical thing there is 
it, well, it can hide detail in the shadows or hide detail in the shadows. But the other thing that will happen is, is that thing black or is it just underexposed or is that thing white or is it overexposed? Now, we can fix that and we can get much better imagery. The other thing to remember as well is, and it causes an awful lot of problems, as we come out of winter, come into summer and spring, um, we want, we're want we going to be working in bright days or we're working in low winter sun. Shadows move all the time. And the problem for us with photogrammetry is if you're looking at time points and you you fly one line and then you fly the other line to overlap, overlap or then you come to do some nadir or some filling things, the shadows could well have moved in the 10, 10 minutes that you are between each shot. The problem with that is then the photogrammetry software doesn't know that the shadows moved. It just sees an object and assumes it is an object. So you get all sorts of weird artifacts and things that you then either have to figure out or, or clean. Or, it just adds a whole slew of things to our workflow, which if you get the image right to start off with, then you'll get better accuracy, you'll get a better point cloud, you'll have less holes and consequently better meshes and a much better model that you're going to work with. OK, right. But before I go on and show you an example of how we do this and some of the tools and things that I use, um, the other part of this and probably equally important is how you manage the images as we're taking lots and lots of more images or you've got a number of drone pilots or big operations how you organize these images is really important what i see quite a lot is somebody goes out with a drone and gets their sd card and goes straight into pix4d or capturing reality or whatever software they're using and but they don't do any checking of the images before they import them in also, sometimes you may want to build up the model by having images of a certain elevation or a certain bracing or things like that. So how you organize the image is really important. But then later on, how you categorize these and look at images and say, you don't want to send a thousand images to your clients. Maybe you just want to send the ones where there is some specific defect or some specific asset. And um, so or how you organize those is really important. And then also how you organize them for archiving. So when the client comes back later on, you can say, that's it, or oh, there it is, and you can get back to them. So what I use is I've got a series of programs that I use. This is my little kit bag, my tool bag. And I'll quickly go through these because I'm going to show you one, two of them, um, or how they fit in. So and um. um you really need to get a hold of a raw editing or JPEG editing image software. Um, before I jump into this, um, a lot of people think you always have to shoot raw. In an ideal world, yes, you should. But obviously, there's some drones out there who won't allow you to film and uh, to shoot direct raw. It's going to be JPEGs. The issue with JPEGs and raw is raw gives me about two F stops at least of adjustment either side that I wouldn't get with RAW. But the downside is a RAW is a bigger file, so you have a buffering of an SD card, which sometimes means you want to capture RAW. Just because we're going to talk about RAW doesn't mean to say you can't do some of these adjustments with just normal JPEGs, okay? But you have to appreciate that if you are wanting to do inspection, then you probably will not, and you're going to compete with yeah people like myself and the images you'll see, you're going to have to find some way at some point to shoot raw. Now, there's lots of cameras. So Sony phase one, they all shoot raw. And now we also have DNGs, which is a raw file. It's just Adobe's name for them and DJI's name for them. So what we're looking for is a thing that will convert raw images to something we can adjust. So there's a few of those around. So I've got a uh, so the free one is raw therapy. Um, it's free. It's brilliant. Really useful. I like free. Um, it's an open source thing and it will do virtually all the things that you want it to do. The only downside of it currently is the latest update doesn't work with the latest update on a Mac, but I'm sure they'll fix that through. 
The other ones that people will use will be Lightroom. OK, and a lot of people are used to using Lightroom. And there's two versions of Lightroom. There's Lightroom Classic, which sits on your PC, desktop, laptop, whatever. And then there's Lightroom, which is a bit confusing, but that's a cloud based system. Advantages with that? Don't know. I prefer Lightroom Classic, but you can go the other way. OK, and then the system I'm going to be showing you in software quickly is a one called Capture One, which is used to be owned by phase one cameras, but now it's a separate company. And this is a system that they used for phase one developed for making their images manageable. There's two other softwares that I use. So I will use Adobe Photoshop because I've got some live editing. If I want to clean people out or clean objects or get remove things, that's what I use. And then I've got another software I use called Photomatics Pro, which is a great tool for processing. I'm going to show you a quick, in, quick demo of that. And PT GUI is one I use for stitching. I do an awful lot of 360 imagery. OK, and that. And then Topaz Photo AI, which is sort of my emergency sort of international rescue of um, photographs because it allows me to recover images that may be blurred, sharpen them, denoise things in a really well, although I can denoise in all of these. Um, it has a really good sharpening feature, deblurring feature. OK, so those are the tools that I use. You probably need one of these. Um, I'd suggest probably Photomatics Pro would be really useful. None of these are really expensive, by the way. Um, mostly you can get them on a, a, a subscription. It just costs 20 to 30 pounds a month and you'll pay for itself before you coffee break them on, probably. OK, um, right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to jump into a. Uh, let's have a look. Mm, yeah, this one. Can everybody see a screen now, hopefully? Yeah. Anybody there? Yes, we can see that beautifully. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So what I'm here to, so this is a software called Capture One. So I'm not gonna go through all this because um this is part of a training course and a workshop I do. Um, but I'm gonna show you some quick things that I can do with it. So in this case, I've got this is a fairly typical thing. Uh, this is a handheld shot, but it could equally be a drone shot. It doesn't really matter, but we've been asked to inspect the underside of this bridge. OK, and the problem I've got with a camera is it's exposed perfectly for the sky, but everything's backlit. All right. So imagine this could be a shadow. It could be your drone looking down, shadows cast. But I'm just going to show you some basic things of how it works. OK, so what I'm going to do is just play about this image very quickly. So I'm first thing I'm going to do is just increase the exposure just a little bit. OK. This is the equivalent of one F, or these are F stops. So I've just I tweaked it by one F stop, that's all. But what I can do with the high dynamic range things is I can increase the shadows and boost those. So you can see now these things are coming. Uh, I'm getting much more detail. And I can zoom in here so you can see what we're getting. Uh, okay. Obviously, now before and after, this is what it would look like before, lots of things hidden. Now, much better, isn't it? OK, I can do a few more things as well. I'm not going to go into all this, but just quickly, quickly, I can play about and improve things. Uh, I've got my curves tool here so I can play about with this as well. That's a bit involved, but oops, shut that down. And I will want to just improve what we call the clarity just a little bit, not by much, because otherwise it becomes posterized and not real. OK, so what I've done now very quickly zoom back out you see the difference here okay but if i put on an exposure warning here okay all the red areas are still clipped now what i can do is i can back off these highlights and get rid of those okay but if i zoom in here you'll see something you see all these little red lines these little red dots well, you will no, no, not notice these, but all these little red dots have no data in them. And what that means is when I come to mesh or produce a point cloud and then produce a mesh, I get little gaps in the data. Now, you wouldn't notice this because if I zoom back out again, OK, it's hardly noticeable. You look at that and you go, that looks fine to me. But when I come to photogrammetry or meshing and zoom in, all around these edges, I have got no data. 
And the impact of that is when I come to mesh things, the mesh doesn't know what to do. So we've all had this. We've done the photographs and then we get things that have impacted us and then, and and we press the mesh button and it looks rubbish. Well, one of the main reasons is because things have been overexposed, what we call clipped. And so we get this little halo around the edges, which it can't really fill in. OK, so that's one of the things Now we, we can do some things with this. I can tweak the exposure and eliminate those. So we've now got no, we've got, it's perfectly clean data. But what I can then do is I can improve the brightness a bit or I could move the black point. There's a few things I'm doing there, and it's a bit of a balance. OK, so what I can then do is I've got all these other images here that I do. I've got, uh, how many have I got? I've got 347 images that I need to process and tweak. But what I can do with this software, and I could do it with Lightroom too, but this, this software is a little bit easier to work with. Press that. If I right click in the browser and just do control all and select everything and then apply, apply. Okay, and you can see all these images have now changed. Okay. Fairly easy and simple. That's a really quick way of doing it. And in the space of five minutes or more, what I've done is I've improved all the images. I'm going to stick into whatever photogrammetry software flavor I like, whether it's Pix4D, whether it's Reality Capture, Context Capture, Correlator 3D, Zephyr, all of them. All of them need you to do this. But at the same time, if I was just using it for inspection photographs, OK, let's have a look. Uh, so let's go back here. I'm going to do this. I'm going to be, let's press Y. Or we'll do before and after. Hold on a sec. Before and after. So, OK, so this is what it was like before. OK, all oh, the yellow bits, by the way, are the bits that are underexposed. So I can have warnings. And if I look at the histogram here, I've got a few bits that are underexposed, not many. OK, but I've got this to that. Which do you want to give your client? Pretty straightforward, isn't it? OK, now this software is just part. And I'm just showing you a very small part of what it can do. You can spend another 10 minutes and get even better quality. OK, but what I can then do now is I can get these and then I go to export. And I export these as a 16 bit TIFF to wherever I want to and then upload them to my software. And I guarantee what you're going to get is a much better model, a much better inspection. It's quite straightforward and it's not that hard to do really isn't. What we're just showing you is the tip of a bit of an iceberg, though. The course I do is about this is also about what how you can manage things and take photographs and do the better to know at eight hours worth of training. Actually, it's a bit more, but um, I can pad this out to eight hours. I <laughs> know for it absolutely easily. There's another software as well that I use, and this one is um, a, a little bit of joy for me. I'll just drag it in. Um, if I don't want to do all this, there is a software called Photomatics, um, um, which uh, is a bulk processing tool. And um, one of the other things we can do, which we haven't touched on, is if we can't, if it's too bright a sunny day, there's no camera that on the planet is going to be able to capture the full dynamic range if the sun's in there in the scene so what we then do is we use a technique called hdr or bracketing or i call it 32-bit photogrammetry because hdr has been sort of hijacked by some marketing departments and they say it's hdr but it's actually not they're just changing the iso which gives you an effect but it's just not the same um but this software is photomatics pro is a software that's been used since 2007 a lady i think and lots of real estate photographers around the world use it. If I'm taking a photograph inside, a real estate photographer wants to show the view outside the window. And so to do that, what they have to do is one way of doing is taking bracketed images. So they keep and a bracketed image is you take the same f-stop, but you change your shutter speed. So you set a hero image and then you'll take a number of bracketed images overexposed and underexposed and then blend them all together. Well, Photomatics Pro is the software those guys have been using. But a few months ago, we came up, the guys at HDR Software who made this came up and this is really small. You won't see it on your screen. But down here, there's a thing that says, oh, are you a landscape photographer? Are you a real estate photographer? Or do you do photogrammetry? 
because photogrammetry now, what it allows me to do is to batch single photographs. OK, and to batch single photographs, just to make this a bit bigger so you can quickly see it. Oh, where am I? Lost it. Is it going to let me make it big? No, it's not, unfortunately. But what I can do is just take all the photographs from my SD card, put them in here. I'll just get that. And then say it will do a thing called tone mapping. Um, tone mapping will recover the shadows and re uh, and recover the details in the highlights to a degree. It's not going to be perfect because it's all going to be dependent on how well you capture the, in the information. But basically what it's going to do is a version of this, but automatically. And then save them as a 16-bit TIFF or as a DNG, so I can then take them into Photoshop and do more things with them. Um, it will help me pre-process with noise reduction, change some of the chromatic aberrations, okay? And then I just press run. I'm not going to do it now because we haven't got time, but I load them all up and it'll chug away and it will remove a lot of the shadows and a lot of the highlights for you without you having to import or use do anything like uh, use Capture One or Lightroom or any of those things. OK, um, the other thing you can do as well is batch bracketed photographs. Now, I'm not going to go into that now, but I do an awful lot of bracketed photographs when I'm doing heritage work, when I'm doing site construction work. I do a lot of work in the Middle East in Jordan where we're taking photographs in the desert and it's really bright. So I have to use bracketed imagery. And what this process does is it allow it automatically collates them all from my drive, from my SD card, from my folder and runs it for me. So I just hit measure, hit run. And I've once I've done uh, changed a few things in here and then go away and have a cup of tea and a thousand images later, maybe half an hour, an hour. Um, it works. Now, this just sits on my desktop. I got on my laptop and um, there is a command line version. There isn't on all of these things actually sit here because although there are online versions to process things, the problem as soon as you if you lose those, then you lose the copyright ownership of them. I don't know if you knew that, but I always try and do everything I can on my own laptop or my Mac, as I'm using here, as you can probably tell. OK, so that's really um, a quick introduction to what we can do um, with uh, with images really really quickly we're just skating over uh, a fairly chunky subject um uh, and i hope this has shown you how relatively easy it is that you can do things um but uh maybe now is the time like stop and um just hold on let me get back back to my presentation bit okay what did i have else to, what else to talk oh yeah if you want to take, if you want to try Photomatics Pro, it, I think it's about eighty pounds, ninety pounds, something like that. And um, if you click on the QR code, then you can go to a, a free trial, and um, so you can try it out yourself. There's lots of instruction videos that go along with it. There's a bit of a bit I've done as well um, that you might be interested in. Sort of what my philosophy about photogrammetry and drones and all sorts of stuff is. But if you click on that QR code, you can go and download a free trial. And then I think it's about 80 pounds. But if you think how much time is going to save you, it's probably the bargain of the year. Uh, I think it's a tool that I think every photogrammetrist, every drone operator should have. I use it pretty well every day and I'm having to process anything from a, a few hundred to a few thousand images a week, sometimes more. OK, oh, and the last little plug is if you want to know any more about this, please feel free to drop me a line. But um, we do uh, an eight hour inspection photography workshop, um, which is whether you're using drones or handheld or a smartphone or things to show you how you can get the best out of imagery. The next one's on next month. Drop me a line, QR code to go and register or find out more about it. That's end of the sales plug. Sorry, but yeah, it's my business. That's what I do. So. Hopefully that you'll if you need anything, please feel free to drop me a line. But that's really what I wanted to cover and to start off with. Um, let's go back to um something that isn't a sales plug. <laughs> okay. And what we're talking about here really is dynamic range. Um 
there's lots of other things to talk about. Just changing the color of the shadow and changing the shadows, for example, is just the beginning. You, we also look at the color of the shadows as well, because as I always say, if you put a beach ball on the beach and you photograph it in the sun, it is those colors. But if you come back later on in the day or at night and you photograph it, it's still the same color. It just doesn't look like the same color. And what dynamic range and what 32-bit photogrammetry and image manipulation helps us do is to maintain true colors. There's particular aspects like heritage documentation, well, that's really important, condition monitoring, taking photographs over a period of time. All of these are right, but it's all about, for me, image quality. I know all you are brilliant drone pilots, but the key thing is your deliverable, and that's the camera inside. And what we're trying to do is show you how we can improve those images. Okay, so that's um, what I wanted to cover. And, and we've got a few questions, I think. Um, any more any more questions we've got? All right, while well, changing exposure settings, is it beneficial in the structure for motion process without affecting accuracy, denoise, clarity, and sharpening changes to the pixel structure? Does this impact the FMM processing results or camera calibration? Okay, uh, yes, it does. Um, it does a lot more than um, the software manufacturers would and developers would let would appreciate. But basically, um, what uh, most of these use a thing called a SIFT algorithm. And the SIFT, um, basically, what it does is it, it's a very flexible system, so it can accommodate things, distortions of safer pixels and slight color changes. But if, if I've got no data because it's overexposed or underexposed, the SIFT algorithm doesn't work because there's nothing to pick up. Um, what you will find is as shadows change, then the tie-in points it uses and then the, the, the DSM or a digital surface model and then digital terrain model will subtly change and it will create artifacts that aren't necessarily there. So um, Mr. Anonymous attendee, uh, is it beneficial to them? What I always try and do is try and keep images as consistent as possible. So that's one of the reasons why I use Capture One, because then I can group things. So you imagine that the daylight changes during the day, cloud goes over it, it will change things. But what I'll get is a dark side and a, a light side. And, and just from a simple thing, Anything in the Northern Hemisphere from the 21st of September to the 21st of March on the Northern side is never gonna get direct sunlight. So you're always gonna get a model which looks a little bit weird, okay? Right, so yeah, and short answer to that is yes, it does. And that's it. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, does editing exposure affect the metadata of the image except for position accuracy? Um, no, not really. I mean, I think this is a bit confusing. I mean, the position accuracy is done. Uh, answer this question live. OK, yeah. All right. Um, so the uh, the yeah, we'll come back to that one in a minute. But let me uh, we'll, come, we'll get back to the sharing screen. In fact, I'll, I will stop sharing so you can see me. OK. There you go. I'm back again. Thank you. Um, David Woodhouse, David, any thoughts, comments on mapping moorland and farmland and what to do with the images? OK, well, where do you want to start? Um, a lot depends, really, if you're, it depends on what the why you're doing it and what the deliverable is. Um, if you're doing it to get a digital terrain model, then there's things I would do. But it, to be fair, it's not going to make too much of a difference. What you are looking at is. For example, in the whole agricultural side, um, agricultural photogrammetry and surveying is often used in the colour of the crop or the colour of the vegetation is often used to define its health or whether you need to add a more fertiliser or it's waterlogged and things like that. It's a lot easier if you have a consistent colour across that. So if you've got shadows and things or crops under trees, if you can reduce the impact of it then you're going to get a much better result it's pretty logical isn't it i guess so the answer is uh i'm answering this live yeah you like to uh, i'm answering it live okay and <laughs> um, so i think it really depends on what the deliverable is david um 
I'm happy to give you some advice on that. Different people require different things uh, from it, uh, whether that's crop or vegetation, population, uh, terrain models, um, uh, to show the contours, the shapes for designing drainage, all sorts of different things. Um, that makes sense. Okay. Any more questions out there? Ellen, have you got any more? I am going to come on here as well and uh, just say this is a fantastic example of of um, a fantastic opportunity to ask lots of questions f to Barry. And I've been absolutely fascinated by this. Now, I don't use thing about what I do is I don't actually use any of the technology myself. I talk okay. to people an awful lot though, in, as well. What I particularly liked about the capture one was seeing the before and after images. Mm -hmm. And I very much liked how you could essentially sort of copy paste the the editing solution onto all your different uh, images. Mm -hmm. um, is that best to do sort of per task so that essentially you're sort of saying it's a nice, bright, sunny afternoon. I've done the work here. That's going to be the le best solution for these ones but not necessarily for the ones that i've done uh, photographs that i've taken later on in the evening where the light is different etc or can you just continue through the day essentially no okay so it's a really good point and um, the way it works is you, you you know if you're working on what i call tupperware skies like it's driving you know it's that gray miserable stuff then and you've got no shadows and this isn't normally we don't have to have this conversation but if i've got light changing during the day light changes color during the day so in the morning it's golden in the evening it has a blue tinge now that might not seem super critical but it is if i'm doing crop work or other things so what i want to try and do is make it all what i call homogenous it's all the same so i can i may if so i may well do i what i do is i div divide it into batches so there'll be some bits which are overexposed and some bits are underexposed. Some bits I'm going to have to change the white balance in the morning and sometimes in the afternoon. But what I'm trying to do is get to what I call one hero image. So what I do is I go through all the images and go, where's the best one? Which shows me the best relief, the best natural representation of what I was taking. Um, now, that could be for author photos or it could be inspection photography. OK, I don't want to shoot into dark shadows under roofies and not see stuff. Um, so it could apply for all sorts of things. So what I do is I go through and I divide it into groups. And it's really quick and easy to do that, to be honest. Um, you just do it visually, you just group them together and say, right, and tag them on, say, all my green ones, I'm going to have to do this with all those. What I then do is I pick a, a hero image and I can, in capture one, I can say, right, this is my image and this is what I want to compare it to. OK, and then what I'll do is I'll do slightly different adjustments on each group to bring them to that master hero image. Because what I'm always trying to do is apply consistency right across across all the images, because then everything works better. The model looks better if you have to apply AI to it, as we will do in the coming years to identify content, to identify ca counting cows or deer or whatever it might be. Um, there's a great company I work with called the Earlass up in uh, Edinburgh and they've built a they built their business on counting things. But they need images with the shadows reduced. Otherwise they're looking at, you know, cow, shadow of a cow. Is that a cow? Or is it yeah. two cows? Okay. Mm. So we are now moving into the clarity of the images becoming important. So going back to what you say, yeah, it is a it can be a multi-stage process, but the ability to copy and paste the adjustment across a hundred photographs simultaneously um, uh, uh, is... Um, hugely beneficial, I think, yeah. Well, it, it, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, it just makes sense. And, uh, you know, people invest in not cheap sums in their cameras, especially when you start talking about, you know, some of the higher-end Sonys, in particular like Phase 1s or Vexels or things. Why are you not making sure the image quality is good? It's such a simple thing to do, I think I've shown you. This is straightforward. We can go into another level and do that. And mm -hmm. um, we've got another question here, which I don't mind answering live from an anonymous attendee. And I'm, is using artificial light a plausible solution? Yes, it is. I mean, I 
I don't use flash because um, I do an awful lot of interior photogrammetry. So while you guys and drone people are brilliant at doing the outside of a building and a roof, lovely, what about the other 90% of the building that's inside? Well, that's what I do. Um, so I work a lot with drone companies and then I go and fill in what's inside. When I'm working inside, of course, we've got different lighting systems or different lighting things. If I'm working in a tunnel or under a bridge, yeah. But I don't use artificial light if I can avoid it. I just use a tripod and a longer shutter speed. But that's part and parcel of inspection photography is if you start using powerful lights, then you're always got something else to carry with you. Having said that, you can get lightweight LED things on your camera and use that for illumination. There's nothing wrong with that at all. OK, so that will help you. But what you will find is it will create its own set of shadows. And sometimes the shadows created by an LED are worse than the natural light. Um, so you're still going to have to deal with shadows that are created. OK, um, so, yes, absolutely. You can use artificial light. I don't use flash at all largely because it's uncontrollable. If I'm taking photographs inside a railway tunnel, for example, and there's water and I use flash, it just bounces back and everything's overexposed. OK, but if I use a constant light, then like an LED light source, then that helps me in a number of ways. It helps me focus it better. <laughs> it also helps me point to make sure I'm pointing at the right place to take a close up photograph. For inspection photography, I may just be taking a random close up photograph into a bridge pier or some part of the structure I can't really see. Um, uh, and then adding that to other drone imagery I might get from an Elios or something that is actually going through a culvert or a tunnel um, or inside a tank. There's a zillion different applications, but it all comes down to, for me, making sure you get the best image quality you possibly can. It's not necessarily to do that. Yes, you have to have drone pilot and skills. But essentially what we're doing here is we're taking photographs. So you have to, I think, at least understand how you can maximize the potential of the camera you've invested in. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for those. Um, do we have any more questions? I'm going to give you a, a quick chance, uh, others, to uh ask them because as i said this is a great opportunity i know barry is uh, as he's mentioned he's available for further courses and further detail on this and if you wish to take him up on that then i will make sure that the contact his contact details are on the watch again are on the watch again follow-up emails that i'll send through to you all this afternoon uh, don't forget, we have a number of other webinars coming up in due course as well. The next one planned is Slink Tech uh, in uh, the beginning of May uh, on Project Portal. Okay. Um, Any and there'll be further more. As, okay. And as we said, as Barry has just rightly pointed out, there's another question coming through. Any tips for water masses? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, water masses, these are things I love. OK, water masses fall into the same category uh, as um, glass glazing in buildings, reflection things. Um, water masses can be a puddle um, on, on the ground. We've had a few of those to deal with. Right. Well, one of the things you can do with this imagery is you can create masks for the water. And um, there are some really great tools in particularly in Capture One that have only recently come out just before Christmas, to be fair where you can now use AI tools to mask areas specifically to that. Now, why would you mask them? Well, you once you've masked them, you can then do certain things to that, like make them all the same color, like black, for instance, or white. And the beauty of that is when you upload that to your photogrammetry, there's no data in it. OK, so you don't have to cope with the problems of specularity. If I fly my drone over a body of water, the reason it causes all sorts of issues is because it's changed angles and the same tie-in patterns it's looking for just don't exist. So rather than confuse the issue, um, just you can mask that area and make them all black so there's no data in it. OK, so the water doesn't impact the photogrammetry. Now, you have to be careful with that because if you are flying over areas and there's water and it's 20 or 60 percent of your overlap area that you need, you're still going to struggle. 
Okay. And if you're trying to do things like, uh, there was a job I did a couple of weeks ago for, um, I think someone mentioned it on LinkedIn, where it was a, a, they were taking photographs at low tide of a beach and they had that low shimmer of water, um, as you get quite often. And that just acts like a mirror and it's like a photogrammetry no go area. So you can mask them. So using things like Capture One and to some degree, Lightroom, you can do the same thing, but Capture One's got a really smart workflow to mask water. This, you can apply the very same thing to buildings as well. So you can mask the windows. So you are then only modeling the mullions or the frame around the window. You are killing all the points and removing any reflections from the window by masking those. Now, it used to, I used to do this manually and it would take me forever. OK, now I can actually press a few buttons and click, 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 click. I've got time to show you because I've not, I've not got anything up online. I could demonstrate it. But um, one of the things we do in the workshop is show you how to do how to cope with glass and water. Um, it's not hard. I just need about 20 minutes of your time. That's it. <laughs> And suddenly photogrammetry becomes a lot, lot simpler. And, and the reason I know this is because I've been dealing with this for a long, long time. A lot of people don't get how important image quality and manipulation is to the whole process. And they wonder why things don't work, why they get really weird models or it doesn't look like it did on LinkedIn. Um, it's because an awful lot of people just don't get that there are things you can do to your image, which is going to improve the process later on. And spending 10 minutes or even an hour prior to doing a big model of an oil platform or something, this doesn't take long to do, as you've just seen. I've just changed and done 347 images in a few seconds. It doesn't take long. But if you can spend a bit of time learning about that, suddenly you've got something that your competitor doesn't do. And you're going to have deliverables that is going to make your guys go, oh, that's good. They may not know the power, the problems that you've had with lighting and trying to shoot things from underneath or down or lighting changes. And, and one of the other things I talk about as well is, is what this does as well is it, it extends the time during the day that you can fly your drone. OK, I get people who it's sunny. Oh, we're not going to fly it today because it's too sunny. And you go, well, just learn how to manipulate the images a bit and then you'll be able to extend. A lot of people say they don't fly after four o'clock because the shadows are too long or before that. Well, yeah, you can do this. It's just spend a little time and invest in that, in understanding how you can manipulate your image. It's not going to get you out of jail all the time. Photogrammetry depends on light and light changes all the time. It changes with the seasons, changes with the time of the day, changes with the weather, changes with all sorts of things. Whether you're shooting at night, you've got all the different artificial lights, different colours, then you take it and go inside. And then you've got another nightmare of light. But if you understand how to fix the photographs to make them consistent and mask areas that are going to be troublesome, like water masses or glazing or stainless steel pipes in pharmaceutical plants or petrochemical plants, you can actually do a lot more with it and get a lot more successful missions. And you don't have to go back and fix something. So if you have to go back to any job, you've lost the profit on it. Guaranteed. Because... It's tight. We're being competitive and we need to do this. And this applies to really, really applies to whether I'm using satellite imagery or I'm using manned aircraft imagery uh, from uh, helicopters or fixed winged aircraft drones. I've got a terrestrial. I've got a 360 camera I'm using. Also, more often than not, I mean, the quality of imagery we can get now from our iPhones, our smartphones, our Google Pixel 8s, our Samsungs. We can do a lot with those, an amazing amount to infill data that we want to join up with our drone footage and our drone acquired data. The other the last thing I'd say is we talk about drones a lot as airborne drones, but there's an awful there's a growing number of underwater drones as well to go down and do the photog photogrammetry and stuff as well. So you'll find some people have got drones that are above, but some that go underwater as well. And basically, if you can pilot one, you should be able to pilot another one, I'm guessing. That's me showing my ignorance, probably. But 
the same techniques apply underwater as they do on the surface. Okay, I hope that is a long-winded answer, but um, hopefully I brought in a few more points, Eleanor. I think that did indeed, and uh, I, I can't comment to, comment on how easy it would be to operate drones underwater, and nor do I know the regulations at all behind it. I, the good <laughs> thing is, the interesting thing, I think this is the great thing, is there's no regulations for underwater drones, as far as I know, <laughs> which it makes life a lot, lot simpler for everybody, because I, I, the one reason I don't do fly drones myself is I don't, uh, the Civil Aviation Authority, I don't understand all the rules and regulations. So I know people who do. If I need a job doing, I've got a team of good drone people I know. And oh, by the way, if anybody wants to add their name to the list of my network of drone people I use, feel free to drop me a line as well. I'm always interested in finding local people to help out my clients who say... Um Barry, what? you're always very welcome to contact us as well if you need people in particular areas as well. We have okay, members around the country, so that's not a problem at all. Okay, great. Well, that's, that's something to bear in mind, as I do. I had an inquiry today for a job, uh, this morning for a job, and it's it's stuck out in West Wales, for example. And it's not easy for some an awful lot of people because the travel just increases the price and sometimes puts it out of reach of people. In this case, probably what I'll do, because I know it's near the water, so I'm gonna pro I might have to process that bit myself unless they've been in one of my training courses and then they could do it themselves. So. <laughs> Indeed. Well, thank you very much. I think that's been an absolutely fascinating introduction to shadow busting and some really good hints and tips and ideas uh, and things to follow through on as well. And as you say, sort of spending an hour to save going out flying again and hoping that you're going to get better conditions. Whereas uh, if you go out and fly once, do the the processing side of things as you've suggested before uploading into um, the appropriate software, then I think that you're going to do rather better overall. I'd um, say definitely. But thank you for your time, Eleanor. It's great to talk to people and and, and do some missionary work for what I do. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. I will be uh, uploading this webinar to YouTube and to our website this afternoon and I will ensure that watch again links are sent out to everyone. I know there are a few people who were unable to attend today in person and hopefully they'll be able to catch up again and watch again later. So okay. thank you very much. I will ensure that Barry's email is on the email that I send out to all of you so that you can contact him in due course whether either about his courses or whether you would like to join his his trusted pilot list okay well. I, and and just in general i mean I, I any questions i all that you've got i try and answer them i i have this thing where i work for free on fridays for people so um, yeah if ring me on a friday i might be able to help you and talk you down on things but you don't have to wait for the courses feel free to get in touch in with them um, me by email and i hopefully get back to you and answer some questions my job really is just to share what i know um, and for your ideas of mistakes so you don't have to make them well that's very kind of you to let us benefit from from your experience thank you very much indeed to barry and thank you to all those who have come along and watched us this afternoon okay goodbye and enjoy the rest of your afternoon yeah happy flying everyone bye-bye all right